Well, it's good to be here. I've been here a few times. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would, this morning and turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12. We're going to dive into that. A um, couple of things about what we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 12 is this is a, a parable that I suspect many of you have probably read, and I do this at our church all the time. I always want those who perhaps are visiting or perhaps are uh, not real sure where you are regarding this whole subject of Jesus and whether you believe in him or not, I just encourage you to kind of ride along with us and, and just sense whether or not there's a lot of truth here because uh, I think you'll, you'll find that Jesus can speak to you no matter where you are and in your spiritual journey, so we invite you in that. Here's the setting of Luke chapter 12, at least the parable that we're going to look at. Jesus is talking to a large crowd, and out of nowhere, I mean, just out of nowhere, I, he, you can, he's talking about some very, very serious things, and a man pops up and says, hey, Jesus, would you please convince my brother to divide the inheritance with me? Apparently, he's not too happy. Some sort of an inheritance has befallen he and his brother, and he's all upset because he's not getting his share. Now, as so typical of Jesus, when somebody comes to Jesus and asks a question, if you're at all familiar with your Bible, you'll notice that Jesus rarely ever answers the person, ever. He always goes off on a story. Well, let me tell you a story. You know, a guy came to him one time and wanted to know about eternal life. And Jesus says, well, you're an Old Testament scholar. You're a lawyer. Uh, how, does, how, does the, how does the Old Testament read? And he says, well, it says, love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said, if you'll do that, you can live. I mean, if you could be perfect, you'd have everlasting life. And the man made a huge mistake by saying, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. And off he went on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the guy didn't like the ending, uh, if you remember with that particular account. So here again, we've got somebody not so much trying to trap Jesus as the Pharisees and Sadducees did from time to time, but he's asking a very legitimate question that concerns him. He's very, very concerned about his inheritance. And Jesus is going to take this opportunity to tell a very, very short story. Now, keep in mind, it's a parable, and parables are made-up stories. This never really happened. There is no guy who built bigger barns and all that. It's just a story. The beauty of Jesus is no matter where he was, no matter what the situation, he could come up with a story immediately. And the beauty of his stories are we're in the the story. Every one of us is in this story. You're going to identify with it. To some degree, you're going to say, that's me. I've got this problem. And so Jesus immediately goes for the jugular. He's kind about it, but he gets right to the point. And most parables that Jesus tells have one main singular point. And I always try to leave our people with one point. If I give them three or four or five or ten, they're going to forget them. So I'm going to try to strike home with one major point today, and hopefully it'll uh, touch your heart. So here we are. We're going to take a look at the first couple of verses of, of this parable, or at least the opening section to it. We're going to look at verses 13 to 15 of Luke chapter 12, and then I'll pray and we'll walk through this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this time to open your word. And as you tell us, Lord, that we might really see things that are beyond our full understanding or scope that our natural minds would never grasp. So we ask now that you might open our eyes that we behold wondrous things out of your law. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In this account, when Jesus says, uh, beware of all kinds of greed, let's, let's make sure we really understand something. Jesus does not have a problem with wealthy people. Jesus doesn't have a problem if your business is prospering. Jesus doesn't have a problem if you've in, received a huge inheritance. He doesn't have a problem with that. What Jesus is concerned about is what that just might do to you. 
the damage that might come into your life as a result of a huge pay raise, a bonus, some sort of a windfall, something happens. And Jesus knows the power of money. He knows the dangers of it. And so he's, he realizes this guy wants to deal with this inheritance issue. And he knows that families have problems when it comes to inheritances. There's all kinds of battles. There was a huge battle up in the Washington, D.C. area a number of years ago. A guy owned a very large bookstore chain. And when he was getting near his deathbed, his sons started arguing over who was going to get the inheritance. And they were literally arguing around the father's bedside, trying to get him to sign certain things in the will. It got into the Washington Post and became a huge story of the greed that just literally ripped this family to shreds, just tore them apart. And Jesus wants to make sure that doesn't happen. But he's fully aware of the tremendous power and draw and pull that the world has upon each one of us when it comes to the things that we possess. And so Jesus makes a statement, and it's a statement that I like to tell people, that absolutely no one, no matter how much of a follower of Christ you are, no one believes this statement, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Nobody fully believes that. We believe it to some degree. The older we get, the more we begin to realize that the things of life don't really, don't really, you know, pan out the way we'd thought. We've listened to the gospel of Wall Street and Madison Avenue, and we begin to realize that doesn't do it. But there's still something in the brokenness and the nature of our human heart coming through the line of Adam. There's still an attachment to this world. There's still kind of a love for things and possessions. And so nobody fully believes this message, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And I, I liken this to my brother, who after 20 years of military service, uh, heard a message on missions one day at our church. We had a missions conference, and he heard this message on missions, and he said, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm going to go into missions. So he leaves, and he goes with New Tribes Mission, and he ends up in Papua New Guinea with his family. And here they are in the jungle, and they're, they're ministering to a tribe of people called the Anadu tribe. And my brother goes in, and he's thinking, you know, I've, I've surrendered all. You know, I've, I've given everything up. I have no more attachments to the things of Northern Virginia or the things of America. I've sold my car. I've sold my house. I've gotten rid of all my possessions. I've built a hut down here in the jungle. And he was confessing this to me. He says, you know, I, I was thinking pretty proudly about myself as to how much I had sacrificed and given up. And then one day I was traveling down river and I saw a missionary with a bigger hut. <laughs> bigger barns, more stuff. And then I started thinking the additions I could put onto my hut. And he began to realize the nature of his heart. It simply doesn't go away no matter where you go. Your heart is always there. So let's take a look at this briefly, and then I'm going to give you some real practical truths that are in this particular parable. He says that it doesn't, a man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And in verse 16, he says this, and he told them this parable. Now, you'll notice that the man is asking him this question. And now he is telling them this parable. There's a lot of people around. Loads of people are listening in on this conversation, this dialogue, and wondering, here's this great teacher, and this so-called Messiah, this king of the Jews, this miracle worker. He's got all the answers. Certainly, he'll answer this man. But he answers him with a story, a made-up story, right on the spot. And it's not very long. And so he dives in here. He says, and he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now, right away, the story is starting out with a, with a man who is doing well financially. Jesus isn't attacking that. He doesn't have a problem with that. He's not down on somebody whose crops are doing well whose business is flourishing. But he knows what that can do to the human heart, and so as he's telling this story, he's talking about all of us. We're in the story. Because the entire Bible is about us, but ultimately it's about the hero of all the Bible, and that's Jesus. He comes to the rescue, to rescue us 
from us, to rescue us from our own hearts and the ways we think. And he is not a party pooper. He's not trying to kill the party. He's not trying to put a guilt trip on people. He's not trying to ruin your life. He actually wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to have a rich and powerful life. And he's telling this story. And this guy is in this story, and you and I are in this story. And he has this, all these crops, and he doesn't know what to do with all of them. Verse 18, then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will stow all my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, he's already violating something right off. He's presuming upon the future. He's assuming that he has many years left, so I take it from this story that he's a young man. He's thinking to himself, I've got lots of stuff. I'm, I've made a lot of money. I've got so much stuff, I'm going to have to build bigger barns to house all my stuff. And I think, I, I think I'm going to plan out my, my future. I think I'm going to put all my security in my stuff, in my money. I've got my 401K in place. I've got many years left. I'm in good health. I'm secure with all of this stuff that I've got. I'm okay. And Jesus is reminding us that that's the natural tendency of the human heart to put its security in money and in things and in possessions. And I was telling the earlier services that it seems strange, a little bit of an irony. Next time you take out a dollar bill or a $20 bill or any coin, it has written on it, in God we trust. And here's the irony. The real irony is this that the very thing that God tells us, that Jesus tells us to trust in the least money has written on it the very person we're to trust in the most, God. Strange, isn't it? We take out that bill and, or, we, or we get a lot of money or something comes our way and we just forget. In God we trust. That's how things began. We don't really, not, not really. At least most people don't. They're trusting in all kinds of other things. And then this man, when he talks about he says, I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Now, what he's got in mind here is he's got a life of fun planned out. I don't think Jesus is necessarily opposed to fun. But you see, the main thrust of almost anything that Jesus ever teaches is sort of one central hardcore truth that's very penetrating. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand there is a difference between that is temporal and that which is eternal. Fun is different from joy. The Bible talks about that your joy might be complete, that your joy might be filled in Him. <clears throat> All right, Paul talks about this. Paul is, is writing out of, out of jail. He's got several letters that he writes out of a Roman prison, and he's writing to the church outside, and he says that your joy might be full. Paul's in prison, and he's writing to people outside telling them about their joy. Because fun is very temporal. Fun is Disney World. Fun is Jim and Kim being on a cruise. Fun is going to the beach. But as soon as the fun is over, it evaporates. It's gone forever until the next fun thing comes along. Joy, on the other hand, is the inner spiritual confidence that God's grace is sufficient to see me through my earthly pilgrimage. Very different than fun. Joy is eternal. And Jesus wants to tell stories about joy. And he is not trying to rob this guy of his inheritance. He simply doesn't want him to put his trust in it. He doesn't want him to put his confidence in it because he knows what that will ultimately do to this man. And so the man goes on, he's talking, and in verse 20 it says, But God said to him, to this man, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Who's going to get all of this stuff that, you have, that you've prepared? Now, notice the way Jesus says this. He says, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. This night. Now, notice how he ends this in verse 21. This is how it will be with anyone. Or some of your translations might say, everyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Is Jesus saying that everyone is going to perish tonight? Yes, that's what he said. So is everyone. 
who is not rich toward God. You're going to perish tonight. I don't like, come on now. I read this parable months ago and months before that. I didn't perish the next night or that night. What he is saying is, from his perspective, that since life is so short that everyone literally perishes within a second. Life is so short. This is why the Bible in several places reminds us, it says life is a shadow. It says life is like grass that grows up and withers at the end of the day. Life is a vapor. Life is a hand breath. Lots of different statements because God is constantly trying to say, stop thinking about the stuff. It's going to go like that. Stop worrying about all the money and all the possessions. Yes, he's given us all things freely to enjoy, but life moves so swiftly. I've always thought it a bit humorous. I don't know that God intended it this way. But in the, in the book of Genesis, it tells us that the man who lived the longest of anybody was Methuselah. And it says Methuselah lived 969 years, and he died. Now, in America, we have invented what we call the midlife crisis. We all know what that is. You get, you know, I'm way beyond the midlife crisis, in case you're wondering. I've got a lot more sand at the bottom of the hourglass than at the top, okay? So my midlife was quite a while back. But you know when you get that midlife point, you're starting to think, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm 35 or 40. I wonder how much time is left. And you go out and you buy the red sports car and you, the gold chain, all that kind of stuff. And I've often thought, I've often thought, did Methuselah have a midlife crisis? When he got to be 500, did he say to his wife, Martha, where have the centuries gone? <laughs> Why, it seems like just 300 years ago you and I got married. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if he did or didn't. But you can be sure of this, at the very end, at the very end, he had to have said, this was a brief trip. Wow, where has it gone? Where has it gone? And Jesus doesn't want us looking back and saying, what did I do with my life? Did I waste it? That's the point. The point has nothing to do with whether or not you're wealthy or whether you have a nice car or home. That isn't it. The, it is, the issue is, do, do you find this to be your confidence and your trust and your hope? That's it, because Jesus says, if you do, you've missed it. You've missed real, genuine life, and that's what it's really all about. Now, the very practical side to this is that if you miss out on this, then you miss out on life because this is basically direction for life. When you set the right direction for life, life becomes very fulfilling. When all of our hopes and everything are right here and now, we miss out. Can you imagine Jesus preaching this message on Wall Street? The clanging of the bell, the opening of the stock market, you know, or the closing of the day, and people are in a panic on how much they've made with the stocks, and the Dow Jones did, and everything. And Jesus standing before everybody and going, oh, calm down, just relax. I, I have something I want to tell you. Man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the stock market. He, how well would that go over? He'd be throwing out a dodge in no time. That would not have been a real popular message, but it's still the truth. It's still the truthful message. So when Jesus is telling this, he's simply saying, listen, listen, everybody in the crowd and everybody that's ever going to hear this, this is true for all time, 2,000 years old, it's true right today. Listen, I don't want you to miss it. I do not want you to miss what life is really all about. Here's a statement, and I suspect you can finish this for me. It's found over in the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Everybody's heard that. People that might be visiting said, you know, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I've heard that before. I, he says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Almost every Christian can quote that. But I wonder how many believers know that that's just half of the verse. What's the first half? The thief has come to kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. You see the but there, the contrast? The thief has come to destroy and kill, and how does he do that? Through inheritances, through huge raises, through bonuses that are used wrongly, that aren't, aren't used for eternal purposes, that are all about me, that the trust is in that. And he says, you missed it. You blew it. You didn't get it. If you put it all together and you think of the other teachings of Jesus and you think about where Jesus says of the enemy, of Satan, he says, 
He is a liar and the father of it. He's a murderer from the beginning. And it also says that he is the prince and the power of this world system. So we can naturally expect that we're going to be lied to every single day by advertisements, by the gospel of America, that this is it, eat, drink, and be merry. There's an ad that came out years ago that says you only go around once in life, therefore you ought to grab for all the gusto you can. I wonder how many of you are old enough to remember that message, all right? And Jesus simply doesn't want us at the very end of our lives to look back and say, what was I thinking? How did I do this? How did I miss it? Because he talks about being rich toward God. How did I miss this? When I use the expression, what was I thinking? How many times are we going to pick up the newspaper or see the news where it talks about a politician, a major sports figure, a military hero or well-known known person, or a pastor or, or whoever that has some kind of a moral fall, a sexual moral fall or a moral fall and getting their hand in the till and robbing from the company or whatever, and all of a sudden it's exposed for everyone. And then they begin to realize, I've lost everything. I've lost my marriage. I've lost my children. I've lost my family. I've lost my stuff. I'm in jail, or I've got to get a lawyer. I've got to fight this thing, or whatever it happens to be. And all they're saying to themselves is, over and over and over again, what was I thinking? Rather than, what am I thinking? You can put the brakes on when you say, what am I thinking? You, it's too late. What was I thinking? It's over with. And Jesus is simply saying, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. I want people to be rich toward God. Here's another little principle that is in this. When you look at these, these, just these few words of Jesus, I mean, who, who could possibly dream up this account just like that? Somebody just walks out of the crowd and he goes, tell you a little story. Off he goes. When you look at this man, not the man that's asking about the inheritance, but the man in the story that says, I've got bigger barns and I need to build all this stuff and I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. When you look at this man, this man makes a fatal mistake. And the fatal mistake is this. This is kind of the central thought of the parable. This man was eternally apathetic and temporally optimistic. Followers of a Christ are to be eternally optimistic and temporally apathetic. We're just passing through. The Bible says we're pilgrims, strangers, sojourners. But this world has a different, a different gospel. And this world every single day is pulling us and pulling us to a totally different message, a totally different gospel. As a matter of fact, when I think of what the gospel of at least my neck of the woods, northern Virginia, it is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. It's, it's, it's the good life. It's the, uh, the American dream. And Jesus warns us against the American dream. He says, it just might turn out to be a nightmare. You just might lose it all. Or you might get everything and still miss out on what life is really all about. And that's his point. That's his whole point. The man steps out of the crowd and demands that Jesus fix this inheritance situation. Jesus goes, I'm not even into that. That's not what I came here for. I have nothing to do with inheritances. But let me tell you a story. And off he goes. And what a story. And as you look at this, you begin to say to yourself, wow, this, this is me. I'm in this. The Bible tells us that he's given us all things freely to enjoy. The scriptures talk about wealthy people. There were wealthy people in the Old Testament. There are wealthy people in the New Testament. The scriptures, and particularly the teachings of Jesus, are not opposed to the wealth. It's opposed to making that your supreme desire in life. If you're at all familiar with the teachings of the Apostle Paul, Paul says in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 6, those that desire to be rich will fall into many hurtful and deceitful lusts which drown people in destruction and perdition. In other words, it ruins their life if that's your goal. Now, Northern Virginia, where I'm pastoring, uh, we have a lot of very, very wealthy people, and I've, I've had the privilege of being there for 40 years now in the same church, and I've seen generations come and go. I've seen people pursue the almighty dollar. I've seen lives wrecked and ruined over that. 
exactly what the scriptures teach. You see, the beauty of the Bible, Jesus' teachings, the teachings of God, is that God knows the human heart so well. He's the ultimate psychologist, psychiatrist. He really understands the human heart. He really understands its nature. He understands the fallenness. He understands the draw of the world, and he knows what the law of the harvest is, that you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and you reap after you sow. That's the problem. It doesn't, the crop doesn't come in immediately. It comes in many years later. And I'm not trying to attack this person, but, it, but it, you know, it's, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. It's no, no secret. Look at Tiger Woods' life. Look at what happened to Tiger Woods. He had to stand before a battery of microphones and admit what he had been doing in his marriage all these years, and he lost his family. And the guy's worth almost a billion dollars, and it's gone, gone, missed it, lost it. General David Petraeus, big general up our way. I know people that have worked with him that know him, and he has an affair, gone, military career, shot, everything. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? When Jesus tells just a very short little story, it is so penetrating, it is so direct. One of the interesting things about the Bible from one end of the book to the other is God often reveals things that make no sense at all. Not only does it go against the grain of our natural thinking, it doesn't make any sense at all. As a matter of fact, if you really studied it, you say, this is crazy talk. Here's an example. We are increasing right now, particularly in the United States, our knowledge of education, medicine, technology, entertainment, you name it, it's increasing at an exponential rate. Every single one of those things are human attempts to make life better. Is life better? Life is worse than it's ever been. People were happier when I was growing up in the 50s, as a matter of fact, the main problems in the school systems in the 50s was gum under the desk, running in the hallways, butting in line, smoking out back, graffiti in the bathrooms. You know what it is today? Suicide, sexting, teen pregnancy, binge drinking, drugs, suicide, bombs, all I, But we, we know so much. We've increased so much in our knowledge. Why can't we fix it? Because it's not a temporal issue. It's an eternal issue. It's a soulish issue. And people without the gospel can't grasp that, so they keep trying harder and harder and harder. If we can just get a little bit more education, a little bit more money, this will do it. And God leans back and says, as long as you push me out, I will give you over to your own way. Romans chapter 1. I will take man in his own craftiness. I'll sit back and watch. I'm not opposed to medical research. I'm not opposed to entertainment. I'm not opposed to any of those things. I'm just opposed to the abuse of those things. And when you leave me out of the picture, you're not rich toward God. Old gentleman I met um, probably 35 or 40 years ago. He died a few years back at the age of 90. He had been a pastor. <coughs> he had been a missionary for well over 50 years, and I, he was, he, his daughter attended our church, and her son-in-law, or his son-in-law, I remember sitting down with him one time when he'd first come over from England. He'd been in the Congo for many, many years, and in France, and in England. Comes over and visits, and I took him out to lunch or breakfast, whatever it was, and they gave him the menu, and I said, uh, listen, Pastor, whatever you want, and he said, oh, you, you, you know, you, 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 whatever you're having, I'll have. And I kept saying, no, whatever, anything. He, so finally, I went to his son-in-law. I said, I don't get it. I said, I've taken him out to lunch several times now. Every time he comes over once a year, I take him out, and he always says, whatever you're having, I'll have. And his son-in-law said, you don't understand. He's never been out to eat before. He doesn't know what a menu is. He's never had a checking account, never had a Visa card, never had anything. This man is probably as close to being a 10 when it comes to giving up the things in this world as anybody I ever met. He and his wife, the most joyful people I had ever, ever been around. Everybody was drawn to them. Just their countenance was just joy. They couldn't wait to literally move on into the next life. So I used to pick his brain a lot. 
And I used to find people that I found that had been, that had really known the Lord for a long time, people that were well up in their 80s or 90s, and I would just try to find out what, what makes you tick. And here's what I think it means to be rich toward God. I think, first of all, it's developing an eternal value system, which the, all these people have. But here are the four things I think that, that, that I get from the years that I've talked to people that are much older than I am. Number one, they have an insatiable appetite for the Word of God. Number two, they have a devoted prayer life. Number three, they have a care-less attitude about the things of this world. They're not anchored to this, this world. They, they really don't care about stuff. And number four, they have no judgmental attitude towards those that aren't as far along as they are. That's what I think it means to be mature in Christ and to be rich in the things of God. And when you're around people like that, you begin to realize that there really isn't anything they covet here in this life. They can go into somebody's nice home and think it's nice and say how lovely it is, but they don't leave jealous and envious and, and really want all that stuff because they've learned just through life that that doesn't do it. It just doesn't. I had the great privilege of experiencing this. I probably had a year and a half, maybe two years, of having the ultimate life when I was about 18, 17, 18 years of age. My father was the superintendent of the United States Naval Academy up in Annapolis, and he's, he was a three-star admiral. And we lived in what is known as the Buchanan House. It was much like living in the White House. We had 12 stewards, servants, we had a greenhouse, we had a, a, uh, a, an industrial kitchen, there was a, a wine cellar, I had a, a barber chair in, literally in my bathroom, with a barber, we had a movie theater, pool table, library, huge home, everything you could possibly imagine. I get up in the morning and just call down to the chef and say, I want steak and eggs, and here's how I want them. Every single day, can you imagine that? Just like going out to Morton's every day. All right, eat your heart out. Right? So after about a year of this, didn't do it anymore. Just didn't do it. Year and a half, Boresville. The eyes of a man are never satisfied. And all Jesus is trying to get through to all of us is this eternal perspective. So I'm going to leave you with this. There are two trajectories in this little story, two major trajectories. The first trajectory is, he says to the man, he says to this, to this man, he says, man, talking to the individual, who made me a divider of inheritances? And then he said to them, the crowd. And then he says, and so it is to anyone who is not rich toward God. First trajectory from a man to the crowd to everyone, that's us second trajectory is he starts with that which is temporal, an inheritance, and he finishes with that which is eternal, rich toward God. How much could somebody package in just those few verses at the drop of a hat? But that's the teaching of Jesus, all right? So here, here, here's where we are. I want you to ask yourself a hard question. I, I don't always give a homework assignment, but I try to leave our people with one central thought. Otherwise, the message just evaporates by the time you get to the parking lot, all right? So here's your central thought. Where am I in balance scales, if you would, regarding the temporal and the eternal? Am I putting my hope and my trust in the temporal? Do I really think that the next thing is going to do it, or am I really trusting in that which is rich toward God? Nothing wrong with having some things. Nothing. Jesus doesn't attack that. He doesn't attack the wealthy. He doesn't attack it. All he's attacking is the human heart and trusting in those things and loving those things. So where are we? Scale from 1 to 10, 10 being perfect. 1, you know, you're beginning to realize everything is about making money or getting the next thing, not doing too well. Well, let's say you think you're a 5. What would it take to make it a 10? You're a 7. What would it take to make it a 10? Well, you're never going to be a 10 in this life, but what would it take for you to really get a hold of this? I battle this every single day. Pastors don't have a pink cloud flo floating over them. We have the same heart, the same battles, the same struggles of loving this life as much as anybody else does. Every single day I get out of bed, I hear the gospel of the world. Eat, drink, 
be merry. This is it. This is life. And then I read the teachings of Jesus. And I just don't want at the end of my life to look back and say, what was I thinking? That's your homework assignment. Think about it. Now here's, I invited you at the very beginning, I invited anyone here who says, I'm not, not sure I'm a Jesus follower. I'm not sure I'm buying into this. Has anything yet resonated with your soul? If it has, you need to give this some serious thought. Because Jesus isn't saying, if you'll give up stuff and sell what you have and so on, you can get into heaven. That's not what he's saying. He is simply saying that this is the kind of thing that may keep you from ever coming to him, ever even recognizing him. You don't even want to think about it. This is what Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks about, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. I, I want to push the truth away. I know this is true. I can feel it in my soul. It, it's, it's what Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And, and I, just, I don't want to hear it. But then you're going to miss out on what life is really all about, and you're going to miss out on eternity. Because if Jesus talks about this and he's telling the truth, you can be sure he's talking about the truth regarding heaven and hell. And so I'm going to offer you this. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you have never, ever come to Christ, and by that I mean looked at your own human heart and said, yeah, I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I'm in a hopeless state. I can't earn my salvation. I can't pay for it. I can't be religious enough. I can't be good enough. I can't perform enough. So I'm coming to Christ today. I'm trusting him as the one that died, was buried, and rose again and paid the penalty for my sin. And when you do that, the Bible says you'll pass from death unto life. You'll be taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of God's dear son. And when you do, life will become abundant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to look into your word to see what you have to say about this subject of loving this world and the things that are in this world. Lord, it's my prayer that no one would leave here today without putting their confidence, their hope, their faith in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. But Lord, I also believe that there are probably some here today that clearly don't know you, and there are many here that do. And those that don't, this would be the day they would trust you, and those that do know you, that they would take a good inventory of their own lives and say, what am I really trusting in? Where's my confidence? Where's my hope? And Lord, I pray that they would really see that their hope is in you. Lord, thank you for being able to tell such great stories, real short stories that just penetrate deep into our hearts, that reveal the truth about who we really are. Because, Lord, you really have come. That we might have a life. We might have it abundantly. That it might be rich toward you. Lord, I do pray that you would dismiss us now with your grace. Give us a day to honor and glorify you. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.